Good day, this is my school YouTube channel. Right there in this video lesson, we are going to solve the Jam CBT past question for the subject Biology, the year 2009. Remember, my name is Abiola. Do not go anywhere, stay with us, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Right there, we are going to tackle question 26 to 50. So, Jeremy, as I start with question 26, the uniqueness of an individual organism in a population is accounted for by variation. All right. So, uniqueness of an individual. So, this uniqueness, you know, this is one thing that variation does. Okay. And the effect of variation, you know, it can come or it can be expressed uh, first inherited characteristics or inherited traits, traits that are inherited, right? Or by acquired traits, that is by environmental factors or what you inherit. So, you can go further by, you know, building a variation, uh, physiological variation, morphological variation, continuous, discontinuous and the like. All right, so the correct option is option B for variation. 27. A phenotypic character with intermediate forms that can be graded from one extreme to the other is referred to as what? Phenotypic. That's physical appearance. All right, that is continuous variation. You know, examples like height, you know, very tall, very short. Okay, um, weight, uh, fat, obesity, slim, and the likes. All right, so this continuous variation, you know, it is either there or not there. There is no extreme sides, okay? Like, for instance, uh, presence or absence of yellows, you know, others like that. Then mutants, we are talking about a particular organism, okay, in this context that has undergone mutation. You know, mutation is the alteration or a change in the structure of the gene. All right, then we have genome. Genome is actually the, all the genetic information, okay, of an organism. All right, so the correct option is option B for continuous variation. 28. A farmer's assumption that the seed from a good harvest will produce a very good yield is explained by the theory of a very good seed, by the theory of heredity. You know, heredity is about the transmission of inherited traits or character from parent to offspring via the chain. Okay, we see that now. So, why evolution is just the sum total of the adaptive changes, you know, that a particular organism or organisms have undergone, they have undergone over a particular period of time, especially a long period of time, that's evolution. Okay, now adaptation, you know, you are looking at um, all those changes that an organism, okay, undergoes so that it can become fitted to its environment or for its environment, you know, in terms of living successfully and um, reproducing successfully as well. All right, so variation, that's the marked difference between individuals of the same species. All right, so heredity well explains for this. Okay, so option D is the correct option. Question 29. The nephridia in the earthworm form part of the excretory system. Okay, singular nephridium. All right, so we know that um, earthworm belongs to the phylum analytes or analida. Okay, common analida like your earth, earthworm and the leeches. Okay, so we know that um, analytes, they, when it comes to reproduction, you know, individuals, they are, yeah, they undergo sexual reproduction, they carry out sexual reproduction. So, individuals may be male, female, or hermaphrodite. Okay, so that's for reproduction. Um, respiration, uh, like earthworm to be particular, you know, it, it carries out exp um, respiration through action of gases through the moist skin. Uh, the skin surface is moist, so that is good. Uh, when, we, when it comes to circulatory system, you know, or even the feeding, you know, it has a kind of asymmetric canals that are just like a tube with two openings, the mouth that the food enters through, then the anus. Okay, the excretory system, we have the nephridium, singular, plural, nephridia. So, the nephridia in the earthworm form part of the what? Of the excretory system. So, option D is the correct option. Question 30. 
A woman with the ability to roll her tongue marries a man who cannot roll his tongue. Okay, so what is the probability of each of their children being a tongue roller? So notice this, heterozygote, homozygote. All right, so let's do the crossing. All right, so I can put the male before the female or the female before the male, whichever one. So I have this, okay, then I have this. All right, this is heterozygote in nature. This is homozygote in nature. All right, so let's carry out the crossing. So I have this to this. Okay, right. Okay, then as well, I have this. Isn't it? So, all right, then let's go to the next one. Okay, then this. Okay. So, we can see that we have 50% um, of the children having the ability to roll their tongue. But the genotypic um, ratio is actually 50%, right? 50 to 50. So, we see that um, we have two of the four children in this particular instance. Two of the four children have the ability to roll their tongue. And two of them do not have the ability to roll their tongue. All right, so the, for the expression, so the question is, what is the probability of each of their children being able, okay, being a tongue ruler? Okay, so the probability is actually 50%, all right, because two out of the four children have the ability or the tendency to be able to roll their tongue. So that is 50%. 50% of their children will be able to do that. 50% of their children would not be able to do that. So let's sort out 50% from the options provided. Okay, so we have that option C. So option C is the correct option. Question 31. A health condition that is known to have resulted from gene mutation is what? So mutation of the gene, you are talking about alteration in DNA structure, right? And in turn, it affects or causes a change in its expression. All right, so such example or such health conditions should include sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, dystrophy, um, Down syndrome, color blindness, just like that. So let's consider the other options. Option C is correct. So typhoid, contaminated uh, food and water, rabies, when you get a bite from an infected dog, it's, it's, it's virus, okay? It's very in nature from virus. Um, we have sleeping sickness. You remember CSS fly, bite of infected CSS fly. All right, so the correct option is option C for sickle cell anemia. 32. Plants that grow in an area that is neither too wet nor too dry are mesophytes. Example, your cassava plant. All right, zero fights, extreme conditions like. In deserts, your cactus plants, uh, epiphytes, you know, they actually grow on another plant. All right, so normally the relationship should be commensalism, normally. All right, then uh, we have hydrophytes, you know, these are actually water plants. For instance, your water lily, okay, so these mosses, orchids, and the likes. Or as I said, I said my, um, your cactus plants. I gave examples of these two. So the plants that grow in an area that is neither too wet nor too dry are referred to as mesophytes. Option B is the correct option. 33. The part of a domestic fowl responsible for preventing heat loss is the down feather. All right. So this is actually soft and fluffy. You know, it is found in the inner part of the body, like very close to the skin, okay, of the bird. Um, we have domestic fowl in this context. All right, so, you know, just to keep the bed warm. So this is what we should be looking at. So option C is the correct option. Question 34. Which of the following animals is most adapted for water conservation? Okay, insects. Right here, when you look through um, the class, Insecta for insects, of course, you know that uh, they are very efficient when it comes to water conservation uh, Probably due to some fissures like um, the efficient um, excretory system, right? What they pass out is almost dry solid then again the outer surface of their body You know, it's um, waterproof due to layer of wax 
then as well you will notice that um, presence of spiracle you know to reduce water loss in the course of gaseous exchange that is where you can find them you know in the hottest the driest place or places on earth rather so the correct option is option d for insects 35 the specialized pigment cells that are involved in coloration and color change in animals okay the chromatophores all right we know they are special uh, pigments that that's we should identify right here okay um, they are responsible for this color change and coloration in animals animals like your um, the pisces group you know the fishes amphibians reptiles all right okay so let's come to this is the correct option option b let's come to xanthophil the xanthophil you know uh, they also this you know animals this is for plants okay so they assist in photo this uh, the photosynthetic uh, process and as well they provide a kind of protection to these cells that are involved in photosynthesis all right then we have um chlorophyll you know that is responsible for trapping the sunlight energy in the course of photosynthesis all right then we have melanin this is responsible for um, the color of the skin right the hair the eyes and also provision of uh, protection or protection just directly protection against the uh, uv rays all right okay from the sun Okay, so absence of this will now lead to what you should um, identify as albinism. So the correct option is option B for chromatophores. Number 36. During the dry season in the tropics, the body metabolism of some animals slowed to a minimum level in a process referred to as what? Okay, so dry season when there is um, a long period of heat or drought. That is estivation. Okay, this estivation you can notice it in animals like uh, your long fish, your crocodiles, your snails, etc. Then hibernation when there is low temperature, a period of low temperature, you can talk about during winter uh, period or winter season. Okay, so you can notice this in animals like your bears, like your bats. All right, then we have dormancy. This is uh, a concept that should be well associated with seeds, plant seeds seeds of plants then uh, we have seen a sense okay right here you are talking about uh, you know deterioration in condition of a particular organism due to aging okay so let me just put it that way so the correct option is option b for st vision do not forget that you can have a jam cbt simulated experience all you just need to do is to click on the link in the description below this is going to get you to the my school website so right there you get to download the my school mobile app for your android devices or you can go for the my school software for your laptops your computers so join me as i solve question 37. according to darwin the driving force behind the evolutionary change is what okay so um by charles darwin in the 19th century we are coming to natural selection and you know this force is actually the environmental pressure all right the concept of the survival of the fittest. Why for Jean Lamarck? You are talking about use and disuse of uh, body parts, inheritance of um, acquired traits. All right. So the correct option is option A for natural selection. Please do not forget that you should always hit that like button. Also, tap on the subscribe button and always hit bell notification so you can get alert immediately. We upload the next video content just for you. Question thirty-eight. Use the diagram above to answer this question. So, the structure that controls loss of water vapor during transpiration is labeled what? Okay, so um, transpiration, we know that that's the loss of water vapor, right? Um, and this occurs via the stoma, for singular stomata, plural. Okay, these are actually pores or openings on the leaf. That is also responsible for gaseous exchange, you know, CO2, oxygen, leaving and entering the cell as well. That is the stomata. All right, so the structure that controls the loss of water vapor during transpiration, this is actually a stoma here. All right, it is being surrounded by the guard cell. So the guard cell actually uh, responsible for the opening and the closing of the stomata or the stoma for singular. All right, so these are the guard cells that are responsible for the closing or the opening. So right now it is opened for gaseous exchange. Uh, typically, we know that the stoma is open during the day and closed at night. All right, so if I want to identify that structure, that would be IV for the guard cells. All right, so um, I, 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 that should be the lower epidemics. 
All right, then we have this. This is the one with the cortical. So the correct option here should be IV. Found in option D. So option D is good to go. 39. Use the diagram above to answer this question. So the part labeled high is the what? All right, so let's do the identification again. The guard cell. This is the stomach, the stomach singular, the lower epidermis. Right, then we have the stomata pore. All right, then um, we have, yeah, this is the high we're asked to label or identify. Rather, right? this is the waxy cortical. This actually provides the part that it's covering. All right, it can be the outermost layer of the leaves of the fruits flowers okay so they actually serve a um, protection function you know protection um, against um, drought protection against um, extreme temperature you know uv radiation um, mechanical injuries you know pests or pathogenic uh, attacks all right so that part is actually i for waxy cortical so the correct option is option c for cortical number 40 Use the diagram above to answer this question. So, emulsification of fat takes place in the part labeled what? All right. So, um, we should okay. As first, let's say identify the parts. Okay, we have I, which is the largest internal organ. That is your liver. So, this is the liver. All right, labeled I. Then we have I high. This is the gall bladder that stores bile. Okay, produced by the liver. Okay, then we have triple high. This is your stomach. All right, where well, we have um, HCL, secreted gastric juice. Okay, then we have this part here, high V. Okay, I just want to um, say I'm going to manage this diagram, okay, for this presentation. I should have my duodenum uh, somewhat around here, all right, not far down like this. So let's just manage it. So we know that emulsification of fat, okay, actually take place in the duodenum. So I'm going to identify this as my duodenum, you know, in the small intestine, basically in the small intestine, but that part of the small intestine should be identified as a duodenum. You know, duodenum is the first part, the middle part, your genome, and the last part, the helium. All right, you get that now. So immediately the chime from here enters into the small intestine, okay, that's the duodenum now. There's certain hormones are released to stimulate the production of um, digestive juices, okay, from the pancreas, all right, I should have my pancreas here, from the pancreas, all right, and from uh, the gallbladder, all right, to release these juices so that uh, further breakdown can actually occur. So emulsification of fat takes place in the part labeled what? That should be the part labeled high V as it would then know, you know, that's by the action of the bile. Okay, so the bile is responsible for the emulsification of fat secreted from the gall bladder, which is a storage um, center for bile. So the correct option here should be option D. Like I said, we are managing the diagram. Okay, that's what we have. So D is the correct option. Question 41. Use the diagram above to answer this question. Okay, so the content of the part labeled I, I, I is usually what? This part is identified as the stomach. So in the stomach, we have the secretion from the gastric gland, the secretions, okay? And those um, enzymes, they are the renin, which acts on milk, and the pepsin, which acts on your protein. All right, so this same gastric gland also secretes HCL, hydrochloric acid. All right, this acid at first should create um, acidic medium so that these two enzymes can actually operate. All right, if you recall the characteristics of enzymes, Okay, so then as well, this HCL also help to kill some bacteria in the food and also in the stomach as well. So the content of the part labeled I, I, I is usually acidic, okay? So from your mouth, alkaline, then in your stomach, acidic, then when it comes to duodenum, it's going to be alkaline, all right? Due to the neutralization reaction from the bile, okay, on the HCL from here in the chine. All right, so let's just go back to what we have here. We have option C, acidic. The content here is acidic due to HCL. So C is the correct option. 42. Use the diagram above to answer this question. The zone of physiological stress is represented by what? So how do we come about the term, you know, the term physiological stress, you know, for every organism or you can say every species or every population you know they have their tolerance range okay so um, the, the range can differ okay this range differs by maybe factors like you know maybe age you know you, you realize that younger organisms they have 
um, lesser tolerance range okay, compared to the adults. It can also differ maybe by the ecological niche or geographical distribution where they are found. All right, so you can see the tolerance uh, differences between um, a saltwater fish and a freshwater fish. Can you see that now? So um, within this range, this is zone two. In this zone two, within this zone two, you know that is the optimum range. You know where the organism is at best when it comes to um, surviving, reproduction, growth. You know the environment, both internally and externally, they are just perfect for the organism. So deviation. Maybe it can be below or beyond this particular point is where the organism experiences this physiological stress. So you can see there is a struggle for survival. You know, there's now a, a kind of um, decline, right, in the rate of reproduction, rate of growth, and the rate of functioning as well. Okay, so like I also identified earlier, you know, certain organisms can be tolerant to temperature while changing um, the acidic level or the pH level of the environment may cause them a great harm. All right, maybe one factor or two can also lead to other, you know, like for instance, certain organisms can do well, you know, when the temperature is quiet on the high side and just like that. Or there, there may be situations whereby maybe a drop in um, oxygen level can affect the tolerance for temperature or for humidity and the likes. All right, so I'm just trying to cook around this particular term. So the zone of physiological stress is represented by this, this zone high and this zone high II. So right here, the organism is actually struggling, all right, to survive. It's not within the best time or the best um, scenario or the best atmosphere or condition to put, all right. So it's just something less than the best, all right. So that zone, the zones are this and this, I and I, I, I. Where do we find that combination? Option D, so option D is the correct option. For T3, use the diagram above to answer this question. So the optimum temperature for the growth of the organism is what? So like identified in the previous video, the previous question we just solved, you know, this is the zone for optimum um, Operation or optimal condition. Yeah, this is the optimal condition. So the optimum temperature for the growth, you know, it lies between 25 and 75. So I can just give it to 50 right here. So that lies in between. So option B, so 50 degrees Celsius. So option B is the right option. Question 44. In the diagram, the structure labeled X is for what? Okay, this is the soccer. These are the hooks, all right, around the rostellum. Um, then this is actually Scolex, the head of a typical uh, tapeworm. All right, so in diagram, okay, this is actually responsible for attachment, okay, to the intestine, to be very specific right now. Okay, so to so avoid, you know, dislodgement in the course of um, whatever activity, okay, inside their host. So this is just for secure attachment, secure attachment. We have the neck around there. So the diagram, the structural label uh, is for option A, attachment. Number 45. In the diagram, the habitat of the organism is where? Okay, so we're going to take this for, this is step one, of course, so let me just identify it as um, tenia solium, the pork tape worm. All right, so we know that the adult pork tape worm actually lives in the small intestine of humans. The adult one lives in the small intestine of humans. So I think this is a very close description. So I can give it to this, option D. So the, we know that the habitat of this is the small intestine of large vertebrates. Option D is good to go. 46, in the diagram, the male sex cells are contained in the part labeled what? Okay, this is your stigma right here. Let's just work with this diagram. And then this should be identified as your anther, you know, on your stamen. All right, that's for your stamen. You know, then you know, on the stamen. For the stamen, we are talking about anther and the filament. All right. So it is uh, in this anther that is where your pollen, all right, your pollen grains they mature. We are talking about the production of male sex cells or sex gametes. So the correct option based on this diagram should be option B for structurally built I I. Please feel free to ask your questions right now. All you just need to do is to click on the link in the description below. This is going to get you to the My School website. Right there, you get to ask your questions and you interact with our solution provider. So why not ask those questions on the spot? So join me as I solve question 47. In the diagram, the likely pollinating agent of the flower is 
spots. All right, so we have different pollinating agents. No, we have wind, we have water, we have insects, we have man, animals generally. So if you want to bring this um, together, all right, the most important ones, they are the insects and the wind. All right, so the insect pollinating flowers, we refer to them as the entomophilus. All right, while the wind pollinated, we refer to it as the animophilus. All right, so for this insect pollinated, you should know that the goal is to actually attract these pollinators, all right, using um, wonderful colors, you know, um, the parts being modified to be very big, or if they are even small, they should be clumped together so that they can be noticeable then as well, using scent to attract these insect pollinators. You know, pollinators like your bees, like your butterfly, like your moths, like your hands as well. All right, so if you look at this flower, you can see that um, the petals are well, you know, they are noticeable, they are conspicuous, so you can see them. All right, and you know that um, insects, they are, uh, they, their favorite food is actually nectar, it's sweet. All right, so, you know, so this is actually meant to attract them, you know, using colors and using scents as well. Certain kind of flowers also present themselves like the opposite sex. Of that insect okay so we have this right here so in the diagram the likely pollination agent is actually insects you can see the display here just like bees no bees are attracted to colors like blue and yellow so such a plant will just express itself with that kind of color to attract pollinators all right so in the course of feeding they pick up these are pollinating um, items or materials they transmit all right so the correct option is option c this is insect pollinated flowers option c is the correct option it is very possible that you have very better solutions explanations to offer please we are so much attentive all you just need to do is to use the comment section below can you indicate the question number and the reviews or solutions you like to share question 48 in the diagram, the high defect illustrated is what? You can see, it's brought to focus behind the retina. So this reveals long-sightedness or hypermetropia. All right, so if it is brought before the retina, that should be short-sightedness or near-sightedness or myopia. All right, so sit there. this kind of person can see distant objects, okay, clearly, but close objects. All right, so that's for hypermetropia. So what we've identified here is hypermetropia. Then this is a, cor a correction lens, which should be a convex lens, all right? The goal is to bring it, you can see, to focus on the retina. All right, so this is the correct option. Astigmatism, you know, um, that's where the image form is distorted. All right, cataracts, you know, the lens is cloudy. I'm just trying to paraphrase. All right, as uh, simple as possible. So the correct option here is long-sightedness is the description we have here. Or you can refer to it as hypermetropia. This can be uh, from the shortness of the high ball, all right, or due to other conditions. So option B is the correct option. 49. In the diagram, the function of the correcting lens is to do what? So we've identified the correcting lens in the previous question, okay, as a convex lens. And what it does here is to actually converge the incoming rays from the closed objects, right? From the closed objects so that the light rays, okay, they can be focused properly on the retina. So the function is to converge. All right, so if you are now, this is for a condition of long sightedness or hypermetropia, of course. So the, that's the reverse for the myopia or short sightedness. Okay, you are going to use a diverging lens. Okay, what it's going to do is to, can you see that, is to actually um, diverge the incoming rays. This is what we are looking at. So the correct option here is option B. Okay, converge incoming rays. Number 50. Chewing the cord is an adaptation peculiar to, okay, it's peculiar to ruminants, all right? So when they chew the cord, it's actually beneficial for their overall health, you know. Um, chewing the cord actually produces saliva, all right, which tends to strike a balance for the acidity, you know, of their digestive system. You know, the, the more the acidic their, uh, their digestive environment, you know, it makes it harsh. Yes, for the rumen bacteria to be able to carry out their work. So, as they chew the cord, saliva is produced, 
you know, acidity is reduced and rumen bacteria can work effectively. So when they chew the cord, you know, they, you know, you identify ruminants as animals that have more than one compartment of stomach. All right, so they can do that, you know, they will bring out the grass they've swallowed earlier, they will chew it just to enhance digestion. So chewing the cord is an adaptation peculiar to ruminants, ruminants like your sheep, your cow, you know, others like that. All right. So the correct option is option D, ruminant. Though we know ruminants are also herbivores, but we want to be very specific. So we come to this ruminant animal. So option D is the correct option. Right there, we've come to the end of this video lesson, but there are definitely wonderful contents to come. All you just need to do is to always hit that like button to motivate us. Also, do not forget your subscription button and always tap on bell notification for you to get alerts. Immediately, we upload the next video content for your comfort.